Um, we've uh, very kindly had uh, a number of questions submitted, and we're going to try and uh, crack through them. Um, by tradition, the first question goes to one of our very long-standing sponsors, the Commercial Education Trust, who has participated jointly with us as partners uh, in this Tacitus lecture these many years. Uh, could I ask the microphone to first be given to David Coftry? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mirval, that was a, a very incisive, positive, if I may say, quite amusing lecture. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed it. You, you held all his, uh, our attention very, very well. Thank you for that. Um, I actually buy into what you say. I fully accept the changes that are coming and when they will come, but they're coming at an exp exponential rate of change. And one of the things that we're concerned with in CET is how do we teach our young folks today for jobs that probably haven't been invented when they're going to go out into the workplace in 10 or 15 years time and should be work ready. What do we teach them hmm. to meet well, your world? Look, it, it's a fantastic question. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, I have to start with the fact that there's probably no more antiquated system in modern life than education. Um, it, the, uh, the syllabus gets tweaked from time to time. Uh, you know, in, L, in um, the lower grades, uh, we, uh, I think both this country and the United States both do a spectacular job for our best students, and we do much less well for people in the inner city and, and other areas. Uh, when it gets to higher education, where um, uh, Britain has an incredible record, uh, you know, going back 500 years. Uh, it's not a record of being very practical. And I don't mean to single uh, the UK out. Uh, most uh, people graduate from university with a degree in something for which there is zero commercial call at all. And, and the notion of that, which I support, is that uh, you're, it's about curiosity, it's about developing intellectual depth, it's about uh, learning how to learn. I, I accept all of those things. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, coming out of uh, school with a degree in art history, which is a wonderful subject, I don't mean to put it down, but no one who's designing that curriculum says, oh yeah, they're gonna get the plum jobs. You betcha. Um, uh, in fact, uh, some of the professions, uh, uh, law and uh, finance, I, I think get a disproportionate uh, number of people going into them, partially because they do provide a way for a uh, s smart, studious person to go through some extra education and, and get a much better job, but we haven't added any new ones in a long time. Uh, even in computer science, which you'd think might be the best for all of this, uh, computer science curricula uh, tend not to be very focused on what's actually done in the real world. Uh, when I was at Microsoft, we would recruit heavily at campuses, uh, but in fact, the work that they would do would be only tangentially related to what, what they had studied in school. So it's a great problem. I don't have a terrific answer uh, for you. Uh, let me add one other aspect. Besides education as a way of becoming educated, we also treat education as a credentialing system. Um, uh, actually, today I became the youngest freeman. I got the free freedom of the city, which in its day was basically a license to practice business within the city. We treat uh, degrees, particularly from our most elite uh, universities in that fashion. It's a credentialing function. Well, this makes lots of people want to have that degree irrespective of whether it's very useful or not. Well, um, it, it, that's a good point to turn to some of the younger members of the audience. If Iski Matthews could raise uh, your hand, a student at Westminster School. Iski? Right at the very back. All the way at the back. Right. Ah, excellent. Thank you. Keep your hand up there. Thank you. Uh, 
thank you for, for, for your talk. Um, I'm Iski Matthews from Westminster School. With the recent resurgence of neural networks into the machine learning community, many newspapers and public figures have claimed their potential to be massive. What limitations, although they don't claim to be you know, a strong AI, might you perceive in neural networks and how would that affect their utility in day-to-day -day life? Well, uh, the, let me explain that neural networks are based on a highly simplified model of what might go on in our heads. Um, it, it's highly simplified because it doesn't have many of the layers of recursion that we are pretty, light, pretty sure happen. So uh, the strength of neural networks is something like the classification of cat videos that I mentioned, or maybe the, our classification of cervical cancer. Um, that my company did. Uh, in those cases, you take a, a, what's called a training set. Here's all of the cases where uh, it's a cat. Here's the cases where it's not a cat. And you tell the machine, you figure it out. And for something like that cat video thing, I forget the exact numbers, but it looked at millions, maybe billions of pictures. Now, humans, in contrast, have the capability that having learned something in one context, we can make an abstract uh, version of that in our heads and apply it to an entirely novel area where we've never seen any data. And so far, that, uh, that has not uh, been the way that AI works. Um, uh, particularly the neural network approach, but really any of the approaches, have not had that automatic ability to take a couple of, of examples, generalize them to make a general thing, go out and test it in the world in a novel situation, and say, oh, I guess I had it wrong. That isn't it, I'll, I'll add another little thing. And, and so far, that's, that's really the, a, a, I think, crucial difference. Well, um, continuing on the theme of uh, young people concerned about uh, the future and their careers, could Conrad Parks, a student at the City of London's Freeman School, hold his hand up? Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to say I've really enjoyed your talk so far. And my question is, what careers should humans be focused on um, to ensure that they secure long-term employment? <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I know someone whose point of view on this is you go into uh, entertainment or, <laughs> um, or other person-to-person -person contact sorts of things because uh, it'll probably be a while before we're amused by robot comics. Um, it, you know, I think that there's going to be a tremendous amount of opportunity. If we look at the last uh, 15, 20 years of the computer business, we've seen it go from something which was initially uh, very, very nerdy, very nerd-focused, which, uh, that's me, that's, that's why I was in the industry then, um, uh, to uh, situations where uh, Major and minor companies have people who worry about user interface, who worry about design, who worry about having things be catchy and new. And uh, many more areas of human creativity have been harnessed uh, in the last 10 years in this industry than there were in the previous 30. Well, I, I, uh... so, so there'll be lots of opportunity in lots of areas. I, I can't tell you exactly which one, sadly. It's certainly one of the most compelling cases I've heard from uh, the Barbican and uh, also from the Guildhall School is that drama is going to be the one to really be inside people's heads. <laughs> uh, but anyway, if I could turn, uh, please, to uh, yet another student, which is great tonight. Uh, could Shaina Sanga, a student at the City of London School for Girls, please raise her hand? Hi there. Thank you for the talk. Um, do you feel there is a need for some regulatory oversight in the AI industry, as suggested by Elon Musk, on a national or even international scale? 
If so, how great do you think these institutions' powers should be so as to promote innovation, but in a safe and sustainable way? Well, uh, one of the um, guys who's a leader in AI at Google likes to say that uh, it's like worrying about overcrowding on Mars. So the, it would be like creating the housing authority to, to give the zoning on Mars. Um, it, I, I think it's enormous. I, I really don't understand his proposal. Um, AI at the moment is, as I said in my talk, is focused on interesting problems. And I hope we can use that to do all kinds of fabulous things. But none of it's particularly dangerous. Um, it's unclear to me what the Government Oversight Committee would do. Um, second, if you really think that AIs are going to become this nefarious um, Sauron-like uh, entities, what's the committee going to do? So it, it just, I, I, I truly don't understand uh, either what the need is for it at the moment or, or literally what would they do? Uh, I mean, you, you could get a bunch of people around to be very self-important and say, you know, we're setting ethical standards with all this, but, you know, in the back room, someone's going to be writing the code. Um, and if you succeed in making it really difficult for people in the UK and uh, the US to write uh, the code for AI, people in China and Russia and all over the place are going to do it instead. So, uh, I, 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 I don't know. Thank you. Um, I, you know, you could have also asked me how come Tesla's market cap per, per car sold is 130 times that of General Motors. Don't know that one either. Well, let's, uh, let's try a question maybe we, we do know. We turn to some of our sponsors. Um, if I could uh, ask Bob McDowell, who's a special advisor to the Cardano Foundation, to identify himself. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward, Dr. Mivo, to the time when you uh, connect artificial intelligence with your baking activities. <laughs> Perhaps that's to come. <clears throat> My question is uh, around the area of intellectual property. Clearly, a lot of the value in technology vests through the intellectual property. And what I'd like to ask is, do you envisage or see increased legal competition by jurisdictions to secure registration of IP within their own jurisdiction? Uh, well, there certainly have been a number of moves uh, uh, for companies, or countries, excuse me, uh, competing in a variety of ways around intellectual property. Um, uh, Ireland, uh, quite some time ago, uh, put in a very favorable tax code for intellectual property, and that's caused effectively any technology company you know the name of, and a whole bunch you don't, have a subsidiary in uh, Dublin, uh, maybe 2% because Dublin's a cool place and you can get lots of uh, good workforce there and 98% to mine the tax advantages. Um, but the, uh, ultimately the problem is what does jurisdiction mean? Uh, there is a court case in the United States right now where uh, the Justice Department of the United States has asked Microsoft to turn over uh, some data that some criminal or, or uh, accused criminal uh, has, which if it was in the United States, Microsoft would be compelled to do, but it's on a server, actually I believe in Ireland, um, who has jurisdiction? It's a fascinating question. Um, you know, <clears throat> when you uh, do a transaction on the internet, you don't know, and in fact it would require tons of effort for anyone to know what servers it's bouncing around all over the place. The, the whole concept of jurisdiction uh, is a very slippery one. Uh, and, and I think going forward, uh, that's only going to increase. 
you know, as you uh, host these things on cloud servers, who knows where the cloud servers are? Fantastic. I'd like to ask if I could, could uh, Julia Fuel, uh, the Managing Director of Online Travel Training and a guest of another sponsor, Beaufort Securities. Uh, thank you very much, Julia. Thank you very much. Um, for 24 years, I ran a recruitment company for the travel industry. And I absolutely echo all of your thoughts that uh, many roles um, that sort of fade away are replaced by many more roles. Um, and I've seen innovation and lots of job creation over all of that time. If you think of Expedia, for example, you think it's one sort of website and one man behind it. It's thousands and thousands of jobs. So I agree with your view there. What I'm interested in at the moment is the, um, the sharing economy and, and how you can hire a, a car for, by the hour. And you know the concept that perhaps we we'll want we won't have hammers and other things that we need, but that we'll just sort of rent them as we need them. And how you think that will affect manufacturing and the whole economy going forward if this continues with owners and renters? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's a great question, and uh, certainly for uh, things like a car service like Uber uh, and uh, a, a set of related things. Uh, it, it's great. Um, you know, you can, uh, whether it's moving yourself around or there's something called Uber Eats, um, Amazon has something similar where you can order from a restaurant and they'll deliver it. Um, those things are terrific. Uh, how far, now of course in those cases, they are far more efficient versions of something that already existed. So, uh, there have been the, there's been the opportunity for you to hire a car and driver for as long as there's been cars and drivers. Um, in, in fact, you could do hansom cabs that way in London before there were automobiles. So the idea of um, contacting a company and arranging to hire a car with a driver is not new. It, what's, what's new is making it very easy, very fast, very convenient. So that rather than having a four hour minimum, as most uh, 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 limousine services would have, you can just go around the, the block wherever you want. Now, so that's fantastic. The, the question of how far that goes into the economy uh, is a interesting one. Um, you know, right now, I'm here in London. There is no one sleeping in my bed back in Seattle. At least I hope not. <laughs> now, okay, in principle, I could be letting out my house uh, on Airbnb or something while I'm here. Eh, it's enough effort that I'm probably not going to do that. Uh, um, some people would. Uh, a, a friend of mine in the UK tells a story about how his grandfather... This almost sounds like a joke, but it's really true. Uh, when his grandfather was running late uh, from his job in the city, he'd write a postcard to his wife. Central London had five uh, mail deliveries a day. Now, the idea of writing your wife a postcard if you're going to be late for work is absurd. In the 19th century, actually, there was a way better infrastructure for that than we have today. So over time, these things have shifted back and forth. Unclear to me whether you can really have a whole company that just sort of just in time shows up for an hour and a half and then everyone dissipates. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, but we've got time for just two more questions. Could uh, Wingate White of Aon, also one of our sponsors, uh, just over there. Uh, Chris, thank you. Can you hold your hand up, Wingate, please? Thank you. Thank you for a terrific speech. Um, we would like to ask what needs to happen for AI to accelerate beyond cat videos and which sectors will drive it? <laughs> well, uh, there's a lot of fundamental uh, research that has to be done. Um, and uh, research in general in science uh, and technology uh, has, has two kinds. There's the, okay, this seems promising, let's play this out. Um, that's what Google did with Google Brain, okay? 
we had a neural network of a certain size. Let's make a bigger one and see if it works better. Then there are the unexpected things that come in out of left field. Um, and those are always the biggest and most important ones. It's hard to know when they will happen uh, or, or what caused them. Uh, so an example I like to use is, if I have the dates right, uh, Principia Mathematica of Isaac Newton is like 1659. Uh, origin of Species, Darwin is 1859. 200 year gap. Now, there's nothing in principle that would say those couldn't have been reversed. And when people in biology uh, uh, have what, what some folks call physics envy, when they say, boy, physics has got lots more theory. And well, actually, physics had a 200-year head start. And because neither one of those great ideas depended very crucially on uh, lots of technology, they, they, they were brilliant uh, men having great ideas, it could have happened that way, or maybe it could have happened even later. So it's very hard to say what is required to get those to happen, uh, apart from the fact that if you set out deliberately to try to have those ideas, it's a lot more likely you're going to have them than if you just sort of wait for inspiration to hit you in the shower one day. Um, uh, my company, Intellectual Ventures, is in part about trying to invent on demand and trying to push people to do that. When I, was, I ran Microsoft Research, it was the same thing. It's how do you try to stimulate people to do the impossible? Um, and it, 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 on any single case, eh, you're probably going to fail. But you do it enough, you probably will succeed. Well, we'll invent on demand a final question, which goes to the home team. Uh, Michael Larson, would you mind holding your hand up for the boys? Great speech, Nathan. Thank you very much. Question for you. Uh, uh, Michael Larson, uh, Worshipful Company of World Traders. Germany's industry is seriously considering a 30-hour work week. Assuming much of this will come via productivity gains and by extension the use of AI, at what point will we be able to stop working altogether? <laughs> or does this mean we can then be as free as we want to pursue alternative careers like writing cookbooks? This is actually very important yes, because I um, like to eat, but I, I can't cook. So I, I really appreciate the notion that you think that writing 2,600-page cookbooks isn't any work. Um, <laughs> so uh, John Maynard Keynes was the great uh, British economist who predicted many aspects of our life, was enormously influential, but he got one thing spectacularly wrong. He predicted that in the 20th century, we would have a 15-hour work week. Now, it's actually true for me, but a different time unit. I, I work about 15 hours a day. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's possible that we could go to that, but how do you do startups then? How do you do really bold new things then? And frankly, if you have a passion for what you do, why would you only do it a limited amount of time? So that's my answer. <laughs>